And I, I, there's a couple of things I want to do. I shared a little bit last week and I felt to just share a little bit this morning too, a little bit about um, the Jesus factory and the vision of the church. And I just want to do it very quickly and shortly. I want it sort of to get into our hearts. But at the time, it was way back in the, um, in the early 19s, 90s. In 1990, we actually were excommunicated from the Church of the Nazarene. And at that time, uh, it was over the issue of tongues and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, they didn't uh, believe in those, in those scriptural things and they were resistant to it, but that's all right, that was fine. And uh, we were meeting in the roller skating rink um, on Wainani Road. Some of you growing up probably went along to that roller skating rink and uh, having services. And the Lord spoke to us, spoke to me particularly about putting down roots and he'd given me a message about um, the land and how we were, God reached down and scooped up the earth and uh, formed man and blew into our nostril, we became a living soul. And then out of man later on, he created woman when he, he, he pulled us apart. <laughs> and uh, now he's putting us back together, which is great. But um, the Lord told me that to put down foundations for the church that we needed to get a home. And uh, we began to seek out. And the Lord had given me like a vision of a Jesus factory. And in the Jesus factory it was a building like this and the, it was open at both ends. And people from all walks of life were coming in this end of the factory and when they came through the doors it was like a giant conveyor belt that they people just got on this conveyor belt and they were carried along through the discipleship program and being filled with the Holy Spirit the gifts of the Holy Spirit and they went out the other end just like Jesus and some of the things that I remember is that when the people went out the other end of the Jesus factory they were just like Jesus like in their character um, in their ability and the gifts and they had the nature of Jesus Christ. So it wasn't like people leaving disgruntled or all of this sort of stuff. It was actually meant to be um, a, a, a warehouse, a spiritual warehouse where people would really develop the nature and the character of Jesus Christ. And, and um, I never saw a cathedral. I know other people have had uh, visions of cathedrals, for, but for me it was never a cathedral that I saw. It was just a factory and, uh, and doing the job. Um, one of the things I shared last week too was uh, the Lord, I was praying one day and asking the Lord to build the church, you know, and, and uh, I'd always had it on my heart. I had a prayer for many years that I prayed over and over again, and Lord, this is your church, these are your people, and I just want your will to be done, and whatever, and I was praying, bring them in, Lord, from the north and the south and the east and the west, because the Lord said this, unless, unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain, and ultimately it's God that builds the house, and so anyway, the Lord said to me this day, what sort of people, and I missed the mark quite often. I remember I said, oh, big people, small people, black people, white people, anybody, Lord, just bring them in. I don't mind, bring everybody in, you know. And then uh, I felt the conviction of the Lord that I was missing the mark. <laughs> and that's one of the, actually, it's one of the major uh, meanings. There's a, a Hebrew word, hamatia, which means to miss the mark. And it's one of the primary uh, words used to describe sin. Uh, and sin is when we miss God's mark, when we, when we miss the mark. But, and, um, and then the Lord spoke to me about uh, what kind of people. And, and I, remember, I remember these experiences in God because he kind of just took over and I got a pen and a piece of paper and I just started writing down. And um, I remember saying, I wrote down things, Lord, I want people who are passionately in love with Jesus, who are zealous about your works, who are bold in the declaration of their faith. Um, uh, people that are great in faith and mighty in battle, soul winning people. And then later on, a few years later, I, I, when the Lord gave me a revelation about the apostolic ministry, I'd added to that building strong local churches because I think the local church is, <clears throat> is, like, is the family unit. Um, a local church is, is a family unit um, that God uses to accomplish a portion of his vision. Every local church in the city has a role to play and God's economy for seeing our city radically changed. And, um, and God puts us in families. And every one of our families, our natural families, are probably quite different, have different values. You've got different life experiences. You grew up in different places in different ways. And it's the same in the local church, that God puts us in a family for a divine purpose. Um, you know, in the old days, you probably wonder where um, surnames came from and you know when you had a, a name like Smith it was because they were a blacksmith or 
you know, um, there's all these names like you might be called Alan Baker because your family were all bakers or you could be a tinker or a tailor, uh, you know, where the tailors came from, of course. And, um, and so uh, what, what we actually find also biblically is, is there's generational careers. Um, the sons of Levi, the, the going down through the generation in the scripture, for the generations, the people often served in the same way. Even, even in the line of David, there's going to be a king born in the line of David. So there was going to be king after king, Solomon, and eventually there was going to be a king who was going to be a Messiah who was going to come and rule and reign forever, which was the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see this generational hand of God moving down. And spiritually, when, when we come into the kingdom, like for Nancy and I, we are both the very first people in our families to come into the kingdom of God. And um, so we, we, begin, we begin a whole new chapter. Um, but the call of God comes on families. I believe that. And, um, and, and, the, and, and so God uses us generationally. And those, that call goes down. Often, often we don't recognize that so strongly today. But um, anyway, that was what I prayed about, what sort of people. <clears throat> don't worry about my voice. It's been a bit of a battle over the last couple of days. I had a day off yesterday and, and uh, <clears throat> holding up bits and pieces. And then, of course, um, there was a lot of other things to the Lord in that journey that I had of establishing the church. Um, there were other things that really the Lord spoke to me about. There were the, originally, there were the five W's, which was worship, word, witness, works, and warfare. And then later on, I kind of added to that wellness, wonders, and wealth. <laughs> I thought wealth was a good one because we all want to prosper. And, uh, and the reason we want to prosper is if we prosper, we can give. <laughs> when we prosper, we can give. We can sow. When we prosper, we can sow. And so po poverty, poverty is, not, uh, is, is so restrictive for us in humanity as far as having an impact on humanity. So when God prospers us, um, it gives us an ability to give and to sow and to go or to send. Um, I've already heard of uh, some sponsorship money just being given to the African mission because someone who had um, the resources to send someone but maybe didn't have the time or the ability to go themselves. And that ability to sow, that's a blessing. That's a blessing for the person who gives and for the person who receives that opportunity to go and to be in Africa. So these are good things. The Lord spoke to me about the reason we don't have a big high stage is because there was a few things about the stage. Actually, the Lord wanted, he didn't want us our, our humanly to be exalted. He wanted to be exalted um, in the house of the Lord. He's the one that we're to lift up. It's not really about us, it's about him. I saw um, in a vision, a great big, huge microphone came down and I really believe the Lord spoke to me and said that, you know, we're supposed to invest in sound because the word of God is to be clearly heard and distinguished and I don't know if there's a week goes by when the worship's on and I think about the sound and, and what we enjoy here in the house and the quality of our worship experience is enhanced so much by that. Um, originally, we had a sign up that said Christchurch will be saved. Um, we had a big yellow gory banner that sat up there. It's still in here. It's still in the heart. We just don't have it hanging on the wall so much anymore. So there were a lot of things. Um, <clears throat> the Lord spoke to me and said that um, it wasn't about advertising, it wasn't about TV, going on TV or being flash or being famous or anything like that as a church or really promoting the church, that our calling was to, um, to really seek the Lord and his presence in our church and in our lives as a family and that if, if we made a way for God to come in the midst of us, then God would bring the people and um, we want the people not to be drawn so much to the church as to be drawn to the Lord. And then, and then as they're connected to the Lord, to become part of his family. We obviously want people to be part of the local family so we can work together to exalt his name and extend his kingdom and advance the kingdom in every way that we possibly can. So there was a lot of, a lot of things. So no advertising or soft promotion, public relation campaigns. Um, God will come. He promised me that he would come if we would seek him and then the people would come because he's here. And um, there were other things. One of the other things that, um, there's a couple of other things as I, I haven't gone there yet, but I probably will and talking a little bit about the apostolic ministry because the Lord gave me a whole revelation around 
um, apostolic, apostolic government and how the church would reach out through that. And then there's another scripture that has been really critical um, for us. Yeah, that's good, Tim. I might need that on the way. I'm not really a big water drinker usually, but thank you. <coughs> and um, and this, is <coughs> this is found in uh, the book of Ezekiel, um, chapter 44. And it was, a, it was a, a chapter that the Lord spoke to me about really very personally, I suppose, and specifically. And um, it's about, uh, you've probably heard it, and I've, I've, I think that I might even share a message on this because it's such a powerful, powerful message during the conference time. And it's a message about the sons of Zadok. And at that time, we know in the history of um, Israel, you know, the people often went away from God. The priests went away from God. When the, when the people went away from God, the priests often followed the people. And, um, and, and as the people began to worship the idols and everything, the priest would accommodate their idol worship in that. And so there's a judgment that came on the priesthood. But there was a family, and, um, and the family, they were, they were the Zadok family, and the sons of Zadok, they were priests. And all the way through, even when all the other priests, the priests had actually compromised their position before the Lord, the sons of Zadok never did. And so God gave them a special promise. And <clears throat> there's a lot about this that I believe um, really relates to us I, it's a personal promise, a personal revelation to me, but I believe it's part of our church. And it says in verse 15, But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer to me the fat and the blood, says the Lord God. They shall enter my sanctuary, and they shall come near my table to minister to me, and they shall keep my charge. And it shall be whenever they enter the gates of the inner court that they shall put on linen garments. No wool shall come upon them while they minister within the gates of the inner court or within the house. They shall have a linen, linen turban on their heads and linen trousers on their bodies and they shall not clothe themselves with anything that causes sweat. And when they go to the outer court, to the outer court, to the people, they shall take off their garments in which they have ministered to the Lord and they'll leave them in the holy chambers, and they'll put on other garments, and in their holy garments they shall not sanctify the people. So uh, it, it, there's a lot in this, and, and um, it goes on, it talks about how, um, <coughs> let me see if I can just find it real, well, it says this, and they shall teach, this is 23, and they shall te my, teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy, and they will cause them to discern between the clean and the unclean, in controversy, they shall stand as judges and judge it according to my judgments. They shall keep my laws and my statutes in all my appointed meetings, and they shall hallow my Sabbath. They'll not defile themselves coming near to a dead person. It goes on. It even talks about they'll not, they'll not let their hair grow long or they'll not shave their heads, but their hair will be trimmed. And it also goes on. It talks about that they will not drink wine that they will, they will not uh, ever be intoxicated. So, you know, as a church, it's, it's very, very common now out in the body of Christ for pastors and leaders and churches to drink alcohol and stuff like that. But, and uh, we've always had a stand. And the reason we have a stand is because of this. <laughs> it's because of these things. It's because of the calling that's on the house. And, um, you know, it, it's, it doesn't bother me if someone says, oh, we have a wine or we have a beer and, you know, we watch over these things. But... Um, I, I, I began to realize quite quickly that in my salvation experience, I got set free from drugs, alcohol, and cigarette smoking, and they're all addictive. I believe they're all addictive substances. And, um, and you know, my testimony is I've never gone back onto any of those things, but I think that the, the alcohol issue, I've always said to people, you may have a different experience with God, and that's fine. I'm not, I'm not judging you. That's your business. But for me, it was a part of my salvation experience, and I believe it is a part because of the calling. Um, I think sometimes, um, you know, that we have to respond to the Lord according to the calling that God has for. We make, we make decisions to do things because that's our calling, and we make decisions not to do things because that's our calling. And, um, you know, because our life, once we surrender our life over to the Lord, our life no longer is our own. 
it, it becomes the, uh, our life becomes God's life, and so now we're living by God's life and God's plans. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish there because I'm not going to preach all my message on that, but it's, a, it's beautiful. Um, the Sons of Zadok is such a wonderful calling. And I don't think it was by chance that Nancy and I, who both of us got saved outside of any local church, ended up in the Church of the Nazarene. And, um, and if you know anything about the, the early, in the early uh, gospel, they called them the Nazarenes because Jesus, Jesus was from Nazareth, the Nazarene. And also in the Old Testament, they had the Nazarite vow. And in the Nazarite vow, um, there's very similar things to the same vow that the sons of Zadok took. And uh, no alcohol, there's other things there that you'll find. But we're not going to go there. And I'm, I've got to do read um, Revelation chapter 5. I read Revelation chapter 4 um, on Wednesday night. And I've just been reading through. I posted on, for anyone that might be interested, I posted a... Um, a thing on the Celebration Facebook page about the book of Revelation. There's, a, there's an organisation, there's a couple of guys that got together and they, one, one's a teacher, a preacher, quite a well-known preacher, teacher, and the other guy's a, a cartoonist or a, a graphic guy and, and they preach and he draws what's been spoken. It's very powerful. And um, I just stumbled over it again last week and um, where the guy was sharing on Revelation and the other guy was drawing, and it, it really helps you to visualize and understand. It doesn't push any particular, you know, pre-trib, post-trib, a, a millennial, pre-millennial. It doesn't, it just sort of gives more of a, uh, an overview of the book of Revelation. But one of the things in this clip that I found that I thoroughly enjoyed, there was this old guy with a big beard who quoted the whole book of Revelation. It's a, t- it's a two-hour tape altogether. And um, I, I just sat there listening to this. First of all, I was amazed that anybody could have a memory to memorize the whole book of Revelation. Um, I remember at the Nazarene Bible College, Theological College, that we were studying, and the, we had a speech teacher over there, and we did this performance for the community, and I had to learn like a chapter of the book of Revelation. And I still remember parts of it. I don't think I could quote it completely, but it was member. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. And that was my part. I felt like a real dork, actually, because um, it was just so foreign to, you know, a Kiwi gangster to be up there, you know, because it was sort of highbrow. You know, they had this highbrow meeting and finger food and important people from the community. And then they got Butch Cassidy up there trying to do the scriptural thing, you know. But <clears throat> anyway... Um, reading through the book of Revelation because there's a blessing. There's a blessing. God promises a blessing in this book. And it says this, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who was worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or even to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and he took the scroll out of my right hand, out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So that was God. It must God was holding on to the scroll, and the lamb comes along and he takes the scroll. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us by God, by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and you have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. So this is very prophetic. You have made us kings and priests, and we shall reign 
on the earth. <laughs> it, it's quite powerful. Then I looked and I heard a voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Remember there was a chorus we used to sing, power and da 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 forever. <clears throat> See, because uh, the book of Revelation, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a revelation of our final destiny, being part of the, all of those whose names are written in the Lamb Book of Life, living for eternity, on the earth, the new heaven and the new earth with God inhabiting us. Um, it's, it's a fabulous book, but it, it's a book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, but it's also, it's also a book of amazing worship. And when, you get, when we get a little bit further into it, it's also a book of this conflict between God and the forces of darkness and you know, all this battle going on and how our God and the Lord Jesus Christ is totally victorious over all the forces of darkness. It said, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. And, uh, you know, just the picture, I don't know if you're a, if you're a picture pers person, but I think one of the things that's really good to do as we're reading the book of Revelation is to visualize and, and begin to see that picture. Some of the things, you, you might find them difficult to understand, the seven horns, the seven things that represent the seven spirits of God, but the things like the seven spirits of God, is, it's mentioned several times in the book of Revelation, but it's also mentioned throughout the Old Testament. It's, it's, um, it's, it's you know, in, in the Old Testament, it lists, you know, the spirit of the first spirit, it mentions the spirit of the fear of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, spirit of might, spirit of knowledge. And it goes on through all of these spirits and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And uh, that's, I know, it's something that Nancy's been carrying. Now, <coughs> my, uh, um, we got saved and we came into the church and full on, pretty enthusiastic about the things of God, still am, as you're fully aware. Um, I have my 50th birthday next year. And um, it'd be 50 years, uh, Easter Friday, that I found the Lord. And uh, that's really exciting to me. Because you know, it's not those who find the Lord that actually enter into the kingdom of God. It's those who persevere to the end. And, um, you know, I want my family and, and my spiritual family body to know is that I'm someone that I'm here to the end. <laughs> you know, I'm going to see this thing through. Um, you know, I'm not pulling out. I'm not backing up. I'm not backing down. I'm not backing out. But uh, when Jesus Christ came into my life, it's a forever, forever commitment going right to the end. I, I want to die in the pulpit, actually, on a Sunday morning with all of you guys here. <laughs> I just want to drop over. You run up. Kelly raised money for the an infibulator. The nurses here in the house, they love these things. They'll run out. They'll go boom like this. And I won't come back. <laughs> I won't. And probably what will happen, they'll boom me again. A little bit of electricity will flow through my body and I'll go like that. <clears throat> and that'll be the end. <clears throat> but there's a lot of things, when you look at your life with Christ, <laughs> when you look at your life with Christ, um, there's a lot of things that happen in your life that you may not take account of. You may think that they're small or insignificant, um, but they're not, they're meaningful. And, and if you ask the Lord, he'll bring back to your memory key events one of the key events in, in my personal life, and I'm going to share a little bit about this this morning, was uh, my pastor, I was only a baby, baby Christian, a couple of weeks old, and he, um, the church was very small, so he was going to do a personal Bible study with me. And he said, what would you like to study? And I've got no church background, and I just pipe up and said, um, I want to study humility, about being humble. And... Um, when I think about it now, I think, you know, what a moron. It's like, what's going through your mind, man? You know, like, there's so many things, you know, I could have said miracles, signs and wonders. There's so many other great things, but I didn't know anything. And I think it was, well, I believe, I believe it was God's hand in my life. Now, the reason that God says to someone, you need to study humility is because you're full of pride. <laughs> you know, that's, 
that's the other side that I'm not going to talk about this morning. <laughs> but um, it, it placed something way back there, and we did this Bible study together, but it, it put something right in the very beginning of my walk with the Lord. It put something in my life that I believe is invaluable. It's an invaluable thing. It's a treasure. It's a pearl of great price um, that God can put into our lives. I want to talk a little bit about that this morning. Um, Jesus said, when he was testifying of himself in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29, he says this, it's really interesting. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I am gentle. Some versions it actually says I am gentle and humble, or humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Um, the, the message of humility really is only really taught within the body of Christ. It's not a, you probably haven't, everybody here who's been educated in the schooling system, I don't think you've had a class on humility. Um, prob probably not, the universities don't teach on it. It's a message that really comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful and a strong message in the Word of God. There were two sisters, Mary and Martha, and Nancy and I joke about this a little bit at home, you know, when we're together and it's kind of interesting because um, uh, it says in Luke 10, 39, talks a little bit about uh, the two sisters and Jesus was coming to visit them and of course Martha got busy and started organising the house and preparing the food and all of the rest of it. And it says this in verse 39, she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So some of the apostles, some of the disciples were there and they were sitting in the house at the feet of Jesus, listening to the teaching of Jesus. Of course, Martha had a little bit of a complaint to the Lord and said, you know, here I am doing all this work and Mary's not really helping me. And then in verse 42, the Lord responds and he says, but one thing is needed and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. So the Lord gives Martha a little bit of a rebuke and not that I, I, I believe that Jesus Christ would have certainly appreciated Martha's activity and the food and the work and the cleaning of the house, but he was bringing out an illustration, but here's Mary sitting at my feet. And that, that term sitting at the feet of Jesus, again, it denotes a certain humility sitting at his feet, um, you know, uh, lowering yourself before God, surrendering yourself to hear the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, <clears throat> Jesus could have said a lot of things, you know. Uh, he could have said, uh, don't you know who I am? I'm God. Uh, I'm the miracle worker. I raise the dead. I cast out demons. I prophesy. I heal the sick. I make the lame to walk. I cause the blind to see and the deaf to hear. Here I am. I'm Jesus. But no, he, he comes back and he, and he says, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking about people in the Bible whose face shone. Like, I know that I talked about the prayer meeting on the Friday mornings, you know, and about the shiny ones coming out. And really, people who have been in the presence of God, there is a, there's something happens to their countenance. It's the same when um, people have been in the world, you know, especially if people who are part of the body of Christ, they compromise their lives in the world, their countenance changes. There's certain activities, um, they begin to withdraw, they begin to isolate, their countenance changes, they begin to lose their joy. Uh, there's all kinds of things. That's why in the body of Christ, one of the things we should be looking out for is our brothers and sisters who are battling and struggling to reach out to them. Because once they start down that road of drifting away from the things of the Lord and compromise begin, it comes in, the devil's right at the doorstep wanting to take them out completely and wanting them to, to destroy their lives. We're, we're in a battle. <clears throat> Three people whose faces shone. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, it talked about his face shone. Uh, Moses, remember he had gone up the Mount of the Lord to receive the Lord. He was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. While he was up there, and his, when he came down, he had to cover his face because his face was shining so much with the glory and the presence of the Lord. Because he gets down to his congregation, his people, Israel, and they're there dancing around celebrating and worshipping a golden calf. Um, no shiny faces down there, I'm afraid. And then the third one, which stands out, and because um, if we haven't already, 
embrace this as part of our Christian life. There's something very special about martyrdom. And it was uh, Stephen, when he was being stoned by the Pharisees, it says that he, you know, he looked up and he saw the heavens open and he saw the Lord standing there in the heavens and it said his face shone like an angel's face and um, the glory of the Lord. But what you, what you can see is that the ultimate, the ultimate of humility had, has to be Jesus Christ and I'll show you from the scriptures why. The Bible actually specifically says that Moses was a humble man. Um, it actually declares that. It doesn't so much say that about Stephen, but what we do see when Stephen's being martyred and stoned, he's on his knees and he's looking up to heaven. Um, you know, because where's our help? You know, in any trial, any battle, any difficulty we face in our life, our hope and our help is always in Jesus. It's in the, in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, you know, it says in the scripture too, don't be concerned about the people that can destroy you physically or your soul, but be afraid or be afraid of the one who can destroy you spiritually, you know, um, the fear of the Lord again. But we don't, I don't want to go too much into that. St. Augustine, you probably heard about him. He was a famous theologian. He was a, he was a, a monk. He was a, quite an influential person on, the, on Christianity in general. And they asked him, they said if there was any um, one important trait that should be developed in the life of a Christian, what would the most important trait be? And he said, humility. And then they said to him, what would the second most important trait be? And he said, humility. And then they said, what, you're going to guess this one, what would the third most important trait be? And this is not a real estate, <laughs> but he said, humility. You know, in real estate, it's um, location, location, location. But anyway, for the... I suppose it is the same, but the location is down, not high. <laughs> you know, um, they, um, <coughs> they use, I heard um, um, Dwight L. Moody, both Nancy and I at the moment, for some reason we're sort of listening to some of the old preachers and teachers and everything, because there's messages that they carry that get left behind if we don't go back and listen to them. And um, Dwight L. Moody, I looked, he gave an illustration about um, humility, and he said, humility's like grass. And uh, I thought it was quite cool, actually, especially for those, um, the lawn lovers. We have lawn lovers in the house, I know. And uh, some people are out there fertilizing, mowing, planting special seed, and the lawn lovers of this world. I'm a little bit, I must admit, a lawn lover. It was an addiction that got into me when I was in Australia because you know the dry climate and that the lawns would all go brown and they had restrictions over uh, watering we used to sneak out and water in the middle of the night trying to have the best lawns in the street it's very important but um it says no matter how many times the grass is cut down it still grows up again <laughs> I thought oh that's interesting then he talked about then the illustration he says yeah the cows and the sheep and the horses and everything they eat the grass over and over again they devour it and then they defecate on it and yet the grass just keeps coming up stronger and stronger and um, he was saying that um, I suppose that uh, like grass is, is at the bottom um, of our lives it's a thing that we walk over it's the thing that often we don't give a lot of respect to it's it's something that's there it's not like the trees I remember when I got saved the, the first morning on Saturday morning after Good Friday night, I remember I went outside in Wellington and there was a great big tree in the front yard of the boarding house that we were living in at the time. We were managing it. And this huge tree, and I went out and I just stood there. I wasn't tripping any longer like I had been tripping for three years before that, but I, I just stood there and I saw this tree, huge tree, with its arm lifted up. And I just had this thought. I thought, it's like even the trees are worshipping God. They're lifting up their limbs to God, you know, and, and acknowledging His glory. Because we know now, I didn't know anything then, but I know now all creation. But the lawn, the lawn, the lawn is lowly. And say, even in our lives, you know, that um, there's a thing too, it's like um, you're going to get cut down, you're going to get cut down, you're going to, and probably defecated on it sometime, whether it's abuse or whatever happens. But. Um, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like the grass doesn't stop growing because of that. It pops its head back up and it keeps going and growing. And uh, that kind of interested me. And then he gave another illustration and he talked about the rivers of grace that God wants to pour over our lives. And he said, um, the rivers of grace fall on the mountaintops 
and the river of grace, it, it washes down over the mountaintops and forces the topsoil and all of the nutritious soil down into the valleys. And the valleys became incredibly fertile, but the mountaintops are barren. And, um, and, and I thought, that's an interesting uh, illustration. And, um, and he said, the rivers of grace flow over the proud and the lifted up, but they remain barren. And then he, he said, um, the rivers of grace will bring blessings um, on all of those who are prepared to bow low and bow down before the Lord. There's lots of illustrations in the Bible about humility and that, like there's the tears and the wheat. Another, I've used this illustration before, but the tears and the wheat are in the church, they grow up together. And, and the way that they're identified is that the tears grow straight up, they grow taller than the wheat, because as the fruit develops on the head, the head, what they call the head of wheat, if they're very fruitful, the wheat, the seeds in the wheat bow the wheat down. And, and so the tears grow up strong and they're often seen above the ones that are bearing the fruit. They're the, the tears often, it's the same with the garden. You've got a garden out there and you haven't been weeding it. The weeds will jump up above the plants or the flowers or the vegetables that you're growing. They seem to always grow up above them. And then there's a lot of these weeds today that want to smother the plants. They want to take the light away from the plant, smother, take the lifeblood out of the plant. And, and he talked about that. He talked about the, um, uh, the, tears, the tears and the wheat that grow up together. Um, and and uh, then, then and this, I've stolen this from uh, Moody, that he just said a few things that really spoke to me. He said, the lark, which is a bird, I love birds, said it builds its nest in the lowest places, but is one of the birds that flies the highest. The nightingale, who sings at night in the darkness, hidden so you can't see the bird. It's not a bird that goes on display, but it has one of the most beautiful songs that's ever sung. Uh, he said the branches of the, he talked about he had a pear tree in his house, and he said the branches with the most fruit are the ones that bow down the Ships that carry the heaviest loads or the, the greatest loads of cargo sink down in the water. And he said, the Christians who bear the most fruit remain forever grateful and forever thankful. <coughs> um, there was a, a little, I heard this little illustration. The British Parliament's quite interesting because it's, it's unique to any other parliament in the world. In the, parliament, in the British Parliament, they have what they call the House of Lords that are made up by the gentry, I suppose, the, the landowners from the old days, and then they have the House of Commons, which is the average everyday people. But the unique thing about the British um, uh, Parliament is they also have a representation from the church because um, the Church of England, you know, and the King and the Queen are the head of the Church of England, and there's uh, bishops, I don't know if there's 16 or 23, you could probably look that up, bishops, um, out of the religion that they are in, they are in Parliament, and they have a voice in Parliament. So um, they were talking about. I heard this illustration. They were talking about how there was a petition that was raised up by the people in England, and um, it was a huge petition. The people felt for sure that as they were going to petition government, that the government would receive the petition and it would bring about radical changes. But when they presented the petition. Um, <coughs> They said, um, uh, let me see, instead of actually at the head of the petition, instead of saying, we humbly beseech thee to consider this petition, it said, we beseech you. And the British Parliament threw the whole pet petition out because, because th they felt that the people were bringing something that was forcing change rather than submitting. If you, if you study... Um, your relationship with leadership, um, you have every right to appeal to leadership, um, like if there's things wrong or things happening. The scripture talks about how we make an appeal to leadership, but we don't impose. I've had people from time to time threaten me. If you don't do this, I'm going to go to the newspaper. You don't do this, I'm going to do that and do this. And it usually gets a pretty negative response from me, you know, like do what you want to do. I can't be bothered with this nonsense. But if, if people beseech you, if they come up with humility and say, would you consider this or I'm feeling this or I'm sensing this and I just want to submit it to you, it's a whole different attitude, a whole different response. 
One of the, one of the ones that people, the, the characters in the Bible that stands out quite an incredible way around this area of humility is John the Baptist. Um, in 1 John 19.23, <coughs> um, they were asking him, it says, Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, this is 1 John 19, to ask him, who are you? He confessed, and he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. And then they said to them, who are you that we may give an answer to those who have sent us? What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. He, he <clears throat> it's really inter- it's quite interesting when you, you look at what he said, I'm the, I'm the voice, he didn't even, he didn't really identify as person. He, you know that John the Baptist, as far as prestige in the community, had way higher prestige than Jesus Christ. You know, Zechariah, his father was a, was a priest. He came from a priestly drive. Jesus' father was a carpenter. Um, you know, we know that, um, uh, you know, John the, John the Baptist, he wasn't born, we have no evidence that he was born in a stable, in a, in a manger, whereas the son of God, his father, you know, his earthly father was a carpenter and he was born in a manger. He was born with the animals and if anybody says that God doesn't love animals or is not concerned about animals, he wasn't uh, born in a prissy hospital under special care, he was born in a stable with the animals. And I, I think there's a message in there because often people that are cruel to animals, um, I, I, I think it's a character flaw. I think it's a major character flaw. And I know we, we eat them, we have to do that, but... Um, um, <laughs> but you always hear about those kids that start by strangling and killing cats and animals and treating them badly, they end up killing people. And I, I don't know about you, but um, I don't want to develop a callous heart. I don't want a hard heart. I don't want to be killing, 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 killing and hardening my heart. I, I, want, to, I want to have a soft heart. Um, you know, we raise cattle and recently we've, we've had some, the home kill guy comes out and, you know, I know Nancy and I, there's always a debate and, you know, how can, you know, they're going to have to give up their lives <laughs> for our state, you know what I mean? But um. But the thought of sending them to the works and the stench of blood and all the animals screaming and yelling out and all of that sort of stuff. I'm going to be next week marching with a banner, you know, outside the Belfast works or something. But <coughs> I, just don't, I just don't like the idea of the animals. The animals, it's part of their divine purpose in life to give up their lives for us. That's the reality. I think that's true. And the, um, but we need to do it in a merciful and a kind, the most kind way. And um, I think there's something wrong when people are cruel. Anyway, that, that's my my take on that. So he didn't even say, listen, um, do you realize I'm the son of a priest and, you know, I'm this and I'm that. And um, he just said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Um, he, could have said, he could have said, I baptize more people on the face of the earth than any other living person, because that was actually true at the time. The crowds have come out of Judea and Jerusalem to hear me preach out there in the wilderness, because that was true. The world has never seen a preacher like me ever before. Well, that was all true. Mark 1, 1 to 8, it says, In the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, there comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to stoop down and loose. See, this, this John the Baptist, is, he had an amazing call um, on his life. And, and, um, and, and, but you see his attitude, you see his spirit. Um, he, there's one coming who's greater than I. I'm not even worthy to unstrap his sandals. So we, we see this incredible 
It says, indeed, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And um, so it's a really, you know, we see this interesting picture. And, and I think, um, do you know that uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who all wrote the Gospels, the four Gospels, do you know that not one of them identified themselves in those Gospels that they wrote? None of them started the Gospel saying, hey, it's uh, me, Matthew, here. Uh, just want to, you know, um, doctor. Oh, it might be Luke. Let's go, Dr. Luke. Um, hi, Dr. Luke, um, writing the Gospel of Lord Jesus Christ, big photo on the back cover, statement, a whole lot of recommendations from other important people in the community. Um, <clears throat> do you know that none of them actually identified themselves? Jesus, John, John probably was the closest, and he, he didn't say, John, he just said, I'm the one that Jesus loved. But that could have been anybody. Like, he didn't know me. I'm the one that Jesus loved. <laughs> All of those kids here, they're the ones that Jesus loved. But none of them blew their own trumpet. None of them made the place. And that's why I think part of uh, why those, they were chosen to be in the Bible, their gospel, is because there was a certain humility about them. They were, in fact, I, I went back and I checked. I thought, I want to I check. And uh, like even in this, the Mark, this is how it starts. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What, is, what do you know the gospel of John? John 1, 1. In the beginning was, was God, in the beginning was the Word, you know, God. They, all, they actually, they're not talking about themselves. They're not lifting themselves up. They're not saying, hey, this is um, Apostle John Ministries uh, coming to town. Um, no, it was all about Jesus. They were, they were always showing and teaching everybody, this is all about Jesus. It's not all about, it's not all about us. Um, so anyway, uh, it goes on and, John had a higher position in society than Jesus had, yet he, yet he humbled himself. In John 3.26, um, it says this, Rabbi, who was with you beyond the Jordan, uh, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, whom you have testified, behold, he's baptizing and all are coming to him. So what had actually happened is, is um, you remember John had baptized Jesus? And uh, he looked out and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And they have this little discussion and Jesus says, baptize me. And John says, no, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, you've got to do it so that it's the word of God is fulfilled. See, that John, didn't, John was struggling to understand because his humility said, no, you're the greater one. You should be baptizing me. But the humility of Christ was even, how can you be humbler? He had superior humility. And he said, no, I, you've got to baptize me. He, and, and, and so he, he puts himself in that position where the son of God, the son of man, as he called himself, was even then submitted to another ministry, another man, and was baptized by him. But anyway, it says this, um, he was beyond the Jordan whom you testified, behold, he is baptizing, and they're all coming to him. And John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I, <clears throat> I have sent, but I have been sent before him. He who is the bride is, is, is the bridegroom. He, sorry, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hear him, he rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. And he who comes from above is above all, and he who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. But isn't that interesting? He, he's, saying, he's saying his divine destiny was fulfilled. His joy was fulfilled in the Messiah having the influence over the people. He was celebrating Christ's victory. Christ hadn't died and been crucified at that time, but he's already celebrating who Christ was. And um, Derek Prince, when he, uh, you probably, you know, a lot of you would have read or heard about Derek Prince, and Derek Prince was a medic in the army. I believe he served in Egypt. He served in the Middle East anyway, I know that. And I remember in one of his teaching, he talked about the morning star. And apparently in, in the East, there's a star, they call it the morning star because most of the stars, you know, go out at night or go out in the morning, but they say the there's a particular star in the east that shines so brightly, it almost makes the night like daylight. And, um, and, and of course, Jesus is referred to in the Bible as the morning star. And it, it's really um, uh, 
uh, quite interesting. And he said, um, <clears throat> he said the Derek Prince said, the morning star is so bright it makes the night all, almost like daylight, but when the sun arises, the star disappears. And I want to tell you, when we lift up the sun, every star disappears. You know, we, we have such a problem in society where we want to exalt people and we want to lift them up and we have our sports heroes and our educational heroes and our Christian heroes and all our music heroes and a lot of those are just disgusting and gross to tell you put some clothes on you lot but they're just you know what I mean and but we society wants to worship and exalt people and but but our calling is to exalt the Lord the calling is to recognize who we are and who he who really, really is. Even, even Paul, um, Paul's interesting because in his life, as he goes through his life, he, and I don't want to, he, he, he humbles himself. In 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he says, this is Paul speaking, he says, for I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. So this is, this is Paul promoting himself. I'm the least of the apostles. In Ephesians 3.8, he says, To me, I am less than the least of all the saints. So he's, he, Paul's one of the most influential Christians in the New Testament. He wrote like two-thirds of the whole New Testament. But when he's talking about himself, he's not exalting. He's coming down. So he goes from being the least of the apostles to I am less than the least of all of the saints. And then 1 Timothy 1.15 says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. So now he's, he's already got to the point where he's the least of the saints. And then he says, and I'm the chief of all the sinners. I'm the worst, I'm the worst of the worst. But you see, you see this picture, and it's pr pretty contrary to society in general, isn't it? Who we all want to achieve, you know, and in our school system, you know, you've got this thing now where you don't even have to achieve to get a medal, you just have to turn up, you know. And, um, <laughs> but we love those medals. <coughs> um, Jesus spoke about John. It's really interesting what he said because he said, um, he said in John 5, 35, he said, John, he was a burning and a shining lamp. Imagine Jesus, you know, turning up this morning and saying, hey, hey, everybody, I just want to talk to you about each one of you. You're burning and shining lamp. Don't you let you hide your light under a bushel. You know, this guy was a burning and a shine. This is the testimony of Jesus. <coughs> um, quite interesting what he said. He said in Matthew 11, 11, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of woman, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist. And uh, when John the Baptist was in prison and, and, um, and uh he was going through a time of doubt, which is really interesting, going through a time of doubt, and he sent a message out to Jesus, you know, basically paraphrasing, are you the one? And Jesus speaks back and he says, tell him that I raised the dead and I healed the sick and I, really, really interesting, you know, so even this great prophet of God who Jesus Christ spoke so highly of, he still had his doubts and his fears and that going through. But of course, um, well, we know what happened to John. He lost his head, and um, you know he was he was beheaded. In uh, Philippians two five to eleven, it says this: "So let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. This is this is Jesus, taking the form of a slave and coming in the likeness of men." And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. And the reason it emphasizes that because the death on the cross, crucifixion by the cross was where all of the, the worst of the worst, the murderers and the thieves and all of that, that's how they were dealt with. They were, they were crucified on the cross, but he was even prepared. He humbled himself. And this is really interesting um, these verses, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. And I want to I tell you that every, <laughs> every area where we will break through in, in obedience to the Lord comes about because of humility. Um, pride prevents us from learning. It prevents us from submitting. 
Um, it prevents us from yielding. Pride was the original sin of Satan. He rose up in pride and thought he was something that he wasn't. He was a created being that God created. He thought he was something that he wasn't. And he contended with God for a position that wasn't rightfully his. And, and, and it's interesting because Jesus said he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the... And then it goes on to this, the promise. Therefore God also highly exalted him and has given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those who are under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <laughs> you see Jesus, he's about to go to the cross, he's about to die, he's having the last supper, it's the, um, it's the Passover feast, and of course he changes everything because he doesn't have the roast lamb and all of the bits and pieces because it's a new covenant that's been instituted and he, he's about to have the Passover. Well, what does he do at the Passover feet? There he is washing the disciples' feet. Um, as, if he, as if he's not going to do enough for all of humanity, you know, in a few hours after this, he's going to be crucified for all of the sins of humanity. And in preparation for that, he humbles himself by washing their feet. I always laugh at Peter because... Um, um, Peter has a little discussion with the Lord about the feet washing and, and, um, and he sort of resists and said, no, no, don't wash my feet. This is the paraphrase. And then Jesus talks to him. He says, oh, this is the importance of what I'm doing. And then Peter says, don't just wash my feet, wash my whole body. You know, and you just love, you love Peter's response. Well, if this is a good thing, Lord, I want more. You know, I want all of it. No wonder that he was chosen by God on, the, on Pentecost to stand up and preach that first message. You know, because there was something about, we often look at the impetuous or the negative side of Peter, but there was something really beautiful about Peter. There was something so spontaneous. We might say, oh, he probably didn't even think about what he was saying. You know, when um, he jumps up in the boat, Jesus walking on the water. Is that you? Lord bids me come to you. Bails out of the boat, starts walking on the water. Um, you know, when the, he, he, um, he says, uh, you know, when Jesus is, is talking about uh, going to the crucifixion and Peter jumps in, no, no, Lord, I'm never going to let that happen. You know what I mean? But there's something really wonderful about him um, that really just, just he, he, we see who he really is. Um, so he did, he says, it says this in John 13, 13, you call me teacher and Lord and I say, well, for so am I. If I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also also wash one another's feet. John 5, 19, Jesus said this, Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. <clears throat> and so um, the, key to, the key to Jesus' amazing obedience was his amazing humility. And um, basically he said, I can't do anything. I only do what I see the Father do. And, and see, humility is a key to our victory. It's, a, it's an incredible key to our victory. And, um, and it, it's a willingness to be taught, it's a willingness to be led, it's a willingness to do whatever God tells us to do. And um, I think, you know, next year when I have my 50th birthday, I'm not sure that I've actually achieved the state of humility yet. <laughs> you know, I think there's still battles and struggles going on within my personality as God's still dealing with my life. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lay down in the midst of the challenge you know what I mean? I'm not going to stop pursuing the Lord in the midst of the challenge. I'm not going to stop going back to the Lord on my knees or on my face and asking God to forgive me or to have mercy on me, to help me to be what he wants me to be. Because I, I just feel that um, I wrote down a couple of things here, which I'm going to end with this so the musicians can come. And um, <coughs> see, our call is not just to... Um, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ or even to talk about his amazing life and what he did on the face of the earth and all of those things. Those things are important and they're significant. But, you know, when we come to Christ, um, really our, our call is to live a life in full alignment with the purposes and the plans of God, but contrary to the culture of society. We are, <coughs> we are the counterculture, <laughs> We are, we, are the, we are the Christian culture in the midst of the world. Our values are different. Our attitudes are different. Our actions are different. Our motivation is different. 
Our worship is different. Every part of our life is different. We've actually, we've actually are called of God. Um, do you know that um, um, by the 300, around about the year 300 when Emperor Constantine was the Emperor of Rome, do you realize that um, um, <laughs> Christianity had changed the world? I mean, right to the point where I think that uh, Constantine saw that he was never going to be able to overcome the Christians. The Christians would rather die for their faith than submit to Rome and what Rome had. And eventually what happened, and, and you could, you know, we can talk about this in Mr. Screw, but it came to the point where Constantine declared that the whole nation was now going to be Christian. It's, that's a pretty big declaration. Now, Constantine, he screwed up the church probably to quite a large degree because he, he opened the doors to Christianity and he made another way in other than through the life and the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so paganism came flooding in to Rome, but he, he basically went from the Roman Empire to Christianity and opening up the doors. So this Christianity is subversive. It says in the book of Acts that talked about the disciples and that said these are the guys that turned the world upside down. But they, but they didn't turn the world upside down by military force or by intellectual wisdom, um, you know, or by science, having the greatest inventions. They, they, they turned the world upside down because they lived a life that was so contrary to the society that was around them. And, and I believe that one of the challenges to us in the body of Christ in these days is to live the life. It's time to walk the talk. It's time to live the life. It's time not to just talk about the great things that Jesus Christ did, but it's time to allow the Spirit of God to come into our lives where we begin to really live like Christians. <laughs> we should be the happiest people on the face of the earth. Uh, you know, we, 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 have, we have God, we have everything. And, um, and, you know, I think that the church, we will have a much greater impact on our society, on our family, and on our friends, if we take out the character of Jesus Christ and the lifestyle of Jesus Christ, the humility of Christ into every part of the society that we're in, where we're not striving and fighting and we're not in the game. We're not playing their game. We're not, we're not playing the world's game. Well, you know, you've got to understand that when you come out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, you're in a completely different kingdom and you're no longer operating under the rules of society. Not that you're lawless, but you're no longer operating in that you're operating now under the rules of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a kingdom of generosity. It's a kingdom of mercy, of grace and forgiveness, of kindness and of love. It's a, it's a kingdom where they say if somebody whacks you on the cheek, give them the other cheek. If they ask for your coat, give them your blanket as well. That's probably wrong. It was probably something else they gave, but... Anyway, you get the gist of the message. It's a different kingdom. It's a totally different kingdom. But we've been born into this kingdom. We're different. We are different. We've got to acknowledge that. And, um, and it's our job not to exalt ourselves or even to want to take over the world because Jesus Christ has already been established by God as the one who's going to be the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who's going to be the victorious Christ, who's ultimately going to be the one that every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every king, every kingdom will bow down to him. He's the one that has been chosen by God. And we have the privilege, like John, John was delighted because of the success of Jesus. And we too, we as Christian believers, you know, that's the joy and that's the satisfaction of our life is that he's been lifted up and he's our conquering king and he's our victorious one. And um, anyway, I hope that was an encouragement to you this morning. And, um, you know, it's just something that's been on my heart because I think, the, uh, I think the way forward for the church is kind of on our knees. And, uh, you know, the way, the way forward is certainly um, uh, in submission to Almighty God. And I think that um, what I've discovered about after 49 years of being a Christian, the fruit, the fruit of God's Spirit does not just automatically form in our lives. We have to participate. We have to participate with God. The fruit of the Holy Spirit and humility is formed in our lives as we choose to act the way that Jesus would act. And you're going to have a hundred situations this coming week, opportunities to act like the world or to act like the kingdom of God. 
every business decision, every disagreement with somebody, every situation that happens in our life, that's the challenge. But we're different. We've been born again. We're brand new. We're, we're from a different kingdom. And, um, and that's our calling is to manifest that kingdom wherever we go. Um, even when people cut you off in the traffic, I've started to say to the Lord, because I used to imagine that I had a big um, uh, cannon on the front of my car and I just blew people out of the road. And then I thought, oh, that's not very Christian, really. <laughs> but even that, even that, because, you know, you, you, you analyze your own life. When I was in America, we would drive up and minister in America. We'd drive 12 hours from LA all the way up into Oregon. And when I started out, I'd never say anything to Nancy, but my goal was to never not be passed by any other car. For 12 hours on the road, nobody's going to pass me. I'm going to be number one. I'm going to be the winner. Um, but now I actually find more satisfaction in just putting the brakes on a little bit, providing a gap. I'm a great zipper. <laughs> it's taken 49 years for me to be a zipper, but I'm getting there. So, uh, Father, I just, Father, I just thank you because you're.